Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Creative Mornings. Using DNA to publish BIPOC US history is our um, subject matter for today. My name is Shelly Baxter. I'm the founder and CEO of Our Genetic Legacy. And I look forward to sharing this presentation with you in addition to helping answer some of your research questions along the way with your own family research and how to put it in historical context. So we're gonna start off the presentation. The first half, I'm going to do a presentation just over some of the basics of doing genealogy, especially gen genetic genealogy, um, giving, cause I know that everybody's gonna be of varied um, skill levels. So hopefully there'll be something in that for everyone. I'm gonna, you know, baby step you through it, but not two baby steps. So we're gonna have a lot of um, time for question and answers. So I'll do that first part of the presentation. We'll do questions and answers. And then we will do um, the next part of the presentation where I will show some of the research findings for our new upcoming book that will be coming out in February of 2022. And then we will have another question and answer period. Nick Rock, who is on my advisory board, she is in the room and she will be here to help um, moderate with the questions and monitor the chat. So, and to keep me on track with time, I tend to be long-winded in my answers. So if you have a question and it seems like it's gonna be a more intricate question, I'll give the intro to the answer and then we'll pick it up again at the end um, to give more detail, just to make sure that we can get through all of the questions. So please, please, please ask your questions in the chat as we go along so that um, Nick can have those ready when it comes time and that you know we can make sure that everybody gets the most out of this presentation. And with that, I will share screen and we will get started. Everybody able to see that? I'm going to assume here to see the presentation. If you give me a thumbs up that you can see and hear. Perfect. So as I said before, I'm from Our Genetic Legacy. I'm Shelly Baxter. I'm the CEO and founder. We are a nonprofit publishing house. We are the only publishing house that we use DNA to publish BIPOC authored and edited U.S. history books. So it was 100% authored and edited by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And the reason for that is so many of our stories have been relegated to single sentences, um, a very select group of people that are consistently being taught about, and it has really disenfranchised many of us from the history of the U.S. in terms of our participation and our active involvement in it. We're usually portrayed as the tools that built America and not the people. And so that's one of the focuses of our new history books is to change that perspective and to not just focus on the trauma, but also to highlight some of the triumphs and to inspire future generations to know from where they come so that they can, you know, dream bigger um, to achieve more. And that is our goal. And so we actually focus on everyday Americans, everyday BIPOCs is who we want to um, you know, participate in our programs. We have said before, please ask questions in the chat. There is no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb question is the one that you don't ask and afterwards you say, I wish I would have asked because now you have this opportunity to get your questions answered for free, because as we all know, you know, genealogy can be a very expensive endeavor. And I am here as a resource and using this platform to share my information with you. And that's just what I love to do. So please, please, please ask your questions, put those in the chat. Nick will be monitoring that and we will try to get to all of them before the end of the hour. Steps to genealogical success. 
The first step, take the DNA test. There's a lot of controversy around DNA testing in terms of it's being used now for criminal investigations and you know, medicinal medical purposes, research. And so a lot of people have become leery of taking the DNA test. I can't speak, you know, I can't tell anybody what to do, but I can say if you want to find your lost ancestry, you're going to have to weigh the, um, the pros and the cons of that because just because you don't test doesn't mean that any sort of law enforcement um, issues that are being dealt with they're still going to find their answers because even if you don't test, one of your cousins, I promise you, has tested. And the way that the research is being done and the skills that we are now able to, you know, use a DNA to achieve, at the end of the day, you not testing is not going to prevent some potential family member from being found. And so I'm a strong advocate for, you know, taking the DNA test because I feel like the Richness that it gives to the individual is greater than the risk. That's me and my personal opinion. Everybody has to do what they are comfortable with, but all of my research is DNA based for that reason. Um, what I recommend is there are three types of DNA tests, the autosomal test, the mitochondrial mtDNA testing, and Y DNA test. Autosomal tests are what Ancestry and 23andMe um, Primarily do family tree DNA also does autosomal. And there's some other sites that do it. MyHeritage does autosomal. The reason why I only focused on Ancestry and 23andMe on this slide is because these are the only two where you have to actually take their test. Other sites, you're able to download your raw DNA data and upload it to their database. You're not able to do that with Ancestry and 23andMe. And generally, I say start with Ancestry because they are the most user-friendly and they have the largest database. Um, so that's why I start with them. Mitochondrial, um, the mtDNA and the Y-DNA testing are done through Family Tree Finder. Mitochondrial DNA traces your maternal line. So it will trace the full female line. Both men and women can take that test to test that line. The Y DNA test is strictly for men. It tests the paternal line solely, so it traces that Y. There are three different um, markers that they use. Um, I think it's 111 is the middle one. And when I say markers, that's a number of segments that they test and analyze. And so the middle marker is, I think, 111, and it's generally in the $150, $200 range. Um, what I say to do with that one is do the one that you are most able to afford and family tree DNA actually does allow you to upgrade. So if you start off with the lower, um, you can always upgrade that to get additional information with that Y DNA testing. Slide malfunction. There we go. So as I was saying, you know, downloading your raw DNA data, you can download that from any of the major sites that you have tested with. GEDmatch is the largest database worldwide of DNA. And that is because they allow for every testing company, well, I'll say the majority of testing companies, you can download your DNA and upload to them. So now you increase the pool of possibilities of matches because if you test it with Ancestry and only Ancestry, but you upload to GEDmatch, you now have the opportunity to match against people who have taken MyHeritage, 23andMe, and Family Tree DNA are also on that site. So it just increases exponentially. And the site itself is very cost effective. It's $10 a month. And you only pay on the months that you want. Like you can have a continuous subscription or you can let it lapse in between during times when you're not researching. And then you just pay the $10 and then that'll give you 30, um, 30 days of access. And so that also allows you to analyze the DNA a little further. It's a little more advanced than using the ancestry. So this is like where you kind of will graduate to in terms of um, using that. And it typically has email addresses so that that's how you interact with other matches that you see um, on there. 
Same thing, My Heritage and Family Tree DNA. The uploads are free, access to a lot of the comparisons and analyzation um, factors you will not have access to without pay. My Heritage routinely has periods where they allow for free uploads and free access to the um, DNA that you upload. And they're doing that because they're trying to build their database. So it's a win-win for people who have that. It helps them because they're you know, obviously competing with Ancestry and other larger um, companies. MyHeritage is really good for European DNA. That's where they started. And they're just now really um, getting a foothold in the US market. So if you have um, a lot of European DNA that you are trying to analyze, I definitely recommend the my heritage for that, not solely for that, but that's just one of their um, strengths currently. And then you want to evaluate your DNA results. Um, what commonly happens, well, I won't say actually I will say commonly. What frequently happens is that you people find out that there are unknown or uh, misattributed um, paternity, maternity. It's happened both ways where you do your DNA. And you know your cousin tested and you're looking at your results and you don't see your cousin's name. It happens. So when you first get your DNA results back, you want to look at your DNA and look at your top matches, the first to second cousins, the close family members. You want to look at those to see who you recognize. And that's kind of the first step to determining if what you believe to be your biological family is correct. And the same thing when we're dealing with cases of adoption or people who you know, already know that they don't know who one of their parents is. That's the first thing you do is look at your close matches because the way that the system works is that you compare against other people. It's not that you do the DNA test and then the answer is presented to you in the initial report. It comes by you collaborating and talking to other people because you're going to trace your grandparent line, your parent grandparent line. And so that's how you look at um, the matches and it'll determine like the number of CMs, which is the term is for centimorgans. That's how you measure um, on the chromosome. The higher the CMs, the closer the match. And so that's um, ancestry will break it down for you in terms of close family, first to second cousins, third to fourth, um, but I think it was like fourth to sixth. It goes further back doing it that way. And then you wanna start grouping your matches. So when you group your matches, what you're doing is you pick, pick your first match, click shared, um, you know, matches in common. And Ancestry has the option to put them all in a group. You can color code all of those and put it, you know, if you know it's a maternal or paternal side, then mark it as that. If you don't know, then put side A, because you want to start to separate into these groups so that you can figure out where people should fit on your tree. That's when you start building your tree. Oftentimes we build our tree before we check our DNA. Um, that is, you know, it's a common way to do it, but now that because, you know, the increased accuracy that DNA testing offers us, even if you already have a tree, I suggest that you start over again. Like I literally redo my trees probably every few months just because new information becomes available, algorithms change, search engines change through ancestry. Documents are constantly being uploaded and um, indexed. And so information that may not have been available six months ago may be available when you go to do another tree. Another person may have tested who has information that you know will help you. I also highly recommend that you have a copy of your tree on your own computer, downloaded to your computer. I personally use Family Tree Maker for that. And what that does, it allows you to download all the documents and all the information in your tree, where if you keep your tree solely on Ancestry, during times where you're not paying for the membership, you will not have access to those documents. So this is a way for you to keep the documents at all times on your tree. And you know, there are times of inactivity where you don't wanna pay for the Ancestry membership, but you still wanna be able to have access to your records. Another free source for getting documents is familysearch.org. It's a little clunkier website um, than Ancestry, but it is free. You can also use the National Archives 
all of these records are there. It's just, um, they're just a little bit more work to navigate. And really all of the documents that are on Ancestry, the majority of them actually come from familysearch.org, which is the um, owned by the Mormon Library. And they have the, as part of their missions, one of the things that they do is they go to courthouses all over the world and they scan the documents. They literally have a mountain in Utah that they have blown out the interior of. It is climate controlled, computerized, and they keep microfiche of all of these documents. So that's where, these are, mind you, 100 years of documents. So just based on importance, um, how, you know, in like state activity, including volunteers, how often um, the records are indexed. So that's what I say when new documents are constantly being added because they're being indexed, because it's one thing to scan them, and anybody who's ever done research knows that, you know, you have a lot of documents that you've not done anything with. They have to be indexed in order to, um, you know, function. There will be some collections that are on um, familysearch.org that are not indexed. And it just takes a lot more time to scan through those. And so there's just constantly being an upload of new documents. Also, be sure to link your DNA to your tree on Ancestry because that will trigger what's called through lines. Now, you have to be careful when using through lines. This is why I say verify everything you put in your tree, because when you're using through lines, that information is based on what other people have in their tree. So it shows you people who you are DNA connected to via these names. And you can't take that as gospel as though Ancestry has done the work for you. Everything on Ancestry's database is user confirmed. They don't you know, confirm any of the document information. When you see those leaves, when I first started, I had clicked leaves back to the Queen of England. I told my family, that's, my, that's our cousin. We actually went to London and you know, posed and pretended like you know, the Queen was coming out to see us. When the DNA comes back, um, I realize that we are not in fact related to the queen. <laughs> you would be amazed at how many people have the exact same names as your family members, no matter how unique or unusual you think it might be, there's a high probability that there are a hundred of them potentially you know, living within a hundred miles of each other over years. Because you have to realize naming conventions um, oftentimes are, you know, central to the location. So names that might not be popular today may have been popular back then. So when you think like, you know, I think I have cousin name, um, actually I had to find a cousin named Shelly who spells it like I do, and it's a man. What are the odds? Like, and he's not even totally unrelated to where my name comes from. So it's just things like that that come about um, that you really have to examine the documents. Don't just take the leaf. Do not just take somebody else's tree. Always, always, always confirm the information for yourself that you put in your tree because that's the only way that you can, you know, somewhat guarantee. And it's always going to be based on what's available. It's always going to be new technology, always going to be advancements. And so things are going to constantly be able to add information to your tree over time. The easiest way to keep track of what you're doing is to create a list of research questions. Take it bite by bite, step by step. Don't just jump into the, you know, jump into the deep end. Once you get your basic tree started, start figuring out what the question is that you want to answer. Do you want to know who your great grandpa, who your mother's grandfather is? Great start. Okay, you know, just take baby steps along the way and keep building upon that. Because as you find success, then you know you get more and more confidence and you get more excited. It gets very frustrating when you're just constantly hitting a wall and don't know where to go. So that helps to kind of direct where you're going and keep track of things. Um, when I first started, I was loosey goosey all over the place. Like wherever there was a leaf, I was chasing it. I was like, you know, ADD all over the place. Like, oh look, there's a leaf, there's a leaf. And it quickly takes you down rabbit holes. So really, really try, especially if you can um, you know, have that discipline to focus on the question that you are trying to answer. If things come up that are related to other things, there's a thing on Ancestry called the shoebox. Shoebox those documents to come back later and look at them. 
you know, come up with some system to put those documents somewhere so that you can come back to them, but to stay on your question, because once you get sidetracked, you will get so far to the left that when you come, you'll try to remember like, what, how did you even get here? What were you doing? It's a common um, practice. Common. Well, you, you have some questions. So kind of tailing off your last um, point, you do have a question in the chat. Okay. So do you wanna go ahead and move on to that for, for a little bit? Yeah. Or do you want to finish this section? I just finish this because this will be this might help to um, give some information out. So Got I'm going to go a little faster because as I said, I do give long answers. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> the most common roadblocks are misattributed parentage, which we discussed, um, a lack of collaboration. A lot of times people get upset when they message one of the, you know, a, a match who doesn't match, you know, who doesn't respond back. Everybody tests for different reasons. Not everybody, you know, most people are testing for fun. They want to know what their ethnicity is. They want to know if the story about their great great grandmother is, if she's Native American. They want to, you know, the quick and easy, and then they're done. So you want to be mindful of that and just, you just have to keep moving and working. The brick wall of 1865 is the most, the biggest issue for BIPOCs. And that has a lot to do with the enslavement and the lack of records that were kept where we were actually named by name and not just physical description, including the half relationships that oftentimes ensued from those relationships. And then we have endogamy, which is gonna be our SAT word for the day, probably the biggest word I use today. And that is a practice of marrying within a specific social group, religious domination, caste or ethnic group. It's very common among the Ashkenazi Jewish. That's like a hard, um, very specific research um, discipline in terms of doing the DNA. And you'll see it when you see a lot of these small towns where, you know, it's just, there'll be a lot of intermarrying between families and it just makes it more difficult to determine what your um, ancestral lines are. Now we're at questions. <laughs> so, all right. Um, the question comes from Kimberly Henderson. Uh, her question is, in regard to DNA testing for Native American and Indigenous heritage, can you speak to the differences in DNA results versus family folklore, historical narratives, particularly with African Americans? For example, a lot of DNA tests don't have a full capture of Indigenous samples. So individuals might have a small percent in their results but their family history, stories from old, older relatives might tell a different story. Any suggestions for navigating that realm? Yes. First step is that ethnicity, race is a man-made construct. So when you're looking at ancestry and you're looking at your ethnicity, for general purposes, it's fun, but it's not um, absolute in that sense, because it's really based against the other people who they have, who ancestry has determined are of that ethnicity. So they, and that's usually self-reported. Um, it is not common among Native Americans to do the DNA testing. So, and then a lot of the tribes have been wiped out over time dealing with, you know, from the Indian Removal Act and the, you know, the trail of tears. So a lot of the smaller subsects of um, tribes, they no longer exist. So there's nobody to compare against. So what I say for those, and because I think the majority of the African-Americans I know will tell you that their great grandmother or, you know, somebody was, she had long wavy hair and she was native and I'm one of those people. I have not been able to prove it, but I still will take it to my grave that my great grandmother was native American. Um, the way to prove that is you just have to do the research. You have to do the research. That's the only way to do it. And because Native Americans have a distrust of the government based on, you know, as a whole, based on the things that have taken place, they don't trust doing DNA. They don't accept DNA as entrance into, onto the tribal roles. So you have to do the research and you have to document it the old fashioned way. So you can use the DNA to kind of connect you to a certain degree, but then you have to do the paper research. You have to find the documents. And there's a lot of telltale slides that you'll find in documents. For instance, I have one person who is doing his research and 
upset that he didn't come back with any Native American in his blood, but I have now found his great great grandparents living in Indian territory in 1930. So we're trying to you know, research that to see how they got to be there, what that um, process was. So that's why I say, you just have to do the research. You just have to do the work in order to find that. Okay, next. Yes, we have another question coming in from Simona. Um, thinking about possible data breaches and safety matters, are there any privacy issues in both taking a DNA test and uploading documents and information onto these websites? Yes, short, short answer. Yes, I mean, that's kind of, that's the case of the world that we live in. It's no different. I don't think that the risk is any greater than we do online banking. You know, we're on the internet. Our information is out there and there's so many public documents that you, when you start doing the research and you put in your own name and your birth record comes up, your marriage record comes up, your divorce record comes up. And it's like, recent times within the past you know 20 to 30 years this information is being has come up so the information as i was saying before the beginning it's already out there you're not um preventing anybody from getting you're only blocking yourself the majority of the time because the information is out there and not you know you're not participating isn't going to change the fact that it already exists in the public domain All right, thanks. Um, there's another question in here from Diane. Uh, she is saying last time um, during your last presentation with Creative Mornings, you mentioned that Ancestry was reducing a type of marker. Can you talk about that again? I noticed with African markers, they went down around the time you mentioned that they started. So what have they have done, this is the reason why I um, am an advocate for GEDmatch because with Ancestry, um, has raised the level of the, um, the number of CMs that they require that they will show you the match. So the when you're doing matches in common, 20 CMs is the lowest that they will go to. That is a fairly high standard, especially when you're talking about people of color and BIPOCs because we have so many half relationships. So a lot of those matches that you see that might say, fifth to eighth cousin, if it's a half relationship, it's actually second to third. It's a lot closer than you realize. And Ancestry does not take that into account in their overall um, system. Their reason for that, they say, is server space. I personally think that with, I pay $400 a month and the number of people who pay that amount of money, that the logical explanation is to get more servers. But um, what instead what they have opted to do is to you know, reduce the amount of information they're processing. And so that's where you take GEDmatch into um, effect because it goes down to six and I think you go down to three on certain markets where you can, if somebody has uploaded their DNA to GEDmatch, you compare against them, you can take the base marker, which is seven, you can take it down to three. Um, Ancestry's um, rationale behind that is that it creates, there's a lot of noise. Not every match is a good match. And the lower the CMs, the higher probability of it being noise, which is just random segments that, you know, enough of it showed up to be able to look like something. So you have to verify everything. But that's the way around it at this time. Um, I've seen uh, petitions going around online trying to get Ancestry to change their mind. Ancestry is a multi-billion dollar company and the reality is they don't care. So it's better for us to figure out ways to work around that than to spend time trying to make them change how they're doing business. That's what works for them. And there are workarounds that um, you will find. I would say definitely look for groups on Facebook. There are tons of groups on Facebook that deal with genealogy and DNA. I'm in many of them. You can ask questions. There's a lot of people out there who are willing to give free help um, and you just want to take advantage of that. And you also can learn from their stories and the things that they share. So that's how I suggest um, to get around that. It's that catch-22 of Ancestry where it's the most user-friendly, largest database, but it's not necessarily the friendliest to everyone, especially to BIPOCs, because we do have such a long legacy of half relationships as a result of enslavement that our genealogy is already difficult and that just further um, complicates 
our search. And so that's that. What are we gonna do? Do you wanna do you wanna move on to one more question or do you wanna wait till after the second half? We can do one more. That's good. Okay. So this question comes from Lydia. She states that her parents fled the USSR during World War II. Uh, their families were dispersed by Stalin across the USSR through forced labor camps. Which company should she use to try and locate possible relatives in the former USSR? Wow, first time I've had that question. Um, I'm going to say I would start with my, my heritage, I think, would probably have the largest, has the largest European database, to my knowledge. Um, that was what things that, that's where they started. But I still would be a proponent for ancestry first, just because you're going to find people who have also found themselves now in the US. You're going to find more of them on ancestry, and then you can kind of um, triangulate back using the MyHeritage. Um, I would definitely look for specialty groups on Facebook. You'd be amazed. There's a group for everything. I used to be a balloon artist. There's conventions for us. There's a, you know, there's something for everybody. So you want to find a group um, that is specializing in that, and they could probably better help you. That's just not something that I've ever personally dealt with in terms of um, dealing with the USSR. So I would definitely look for somebody who's specialized in that, look for a group, because finding an independent researcher can be extremely expensive. And there's just things that you can do along the way. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about at the end is ways to, how to use your research dollars um, to get the, the most use out of them and to get you know, the most bang for your buck, things that you can do yourself and the things that it makes sense to pay somebody to do. Shelly, you have one more question. I think it's going to be a quick one. So uh, what is what is the best tree building software? I use Family Tree Maker. Um, that is my favorite. It's a download um, program. I've recently started, um, I downloaded Legacy. I don't like it as much. It has some different features, but Family Tree Maker is the, um, the software that I use and that I it allows you also to do some different types of searches and queries that you can't do on Ancestry as easily. So that is the one um, that I use. I think it's by Soft Kiev or Max. I'll look for that um, in a minute and I will put that link in the, um, in the chat because that is, that's the one that I prefer. Now we're gonna quickly go to, um, some of the findings that we've been able to find with our new, that are gonna be in our new history book. I'm gonna show you some of the things that we were able to determine. So here we have one of our first um, people, his name is Fred. And when we got his DNA back, I did not, um, I'm looking at the same, some of the same steps that I've advised you guys in terms of looking at his close matches. And looking at his close matches, I wasn't seeing some of the surnames that I would expect to see based on who um, I was told his parents were. So then I called and asked a few more questions of him and then we determined that, no, it was potentially someone else. Um, we looked at that and no, it wasn't that person. So what I was then able to do, and then his mother was just deceased when he was a child. So there was nobody to ask. So what we do is we start looking at all his close matches and figuring out what they have in common. Who are their common grandparents? What's the grandparent line? And you can go down, you know, and start seeing names that keep repeating themselves. And then you start building a tree where it's called a mirror tree. You start building a tree for names of people that you don't know who you think belong in your tree. <laughs> and you put them in, you trace them through the documents, to the paper trail, and see if you can find a connection to location or surname that overlaps with you. And you continue to do that until you could narrow it down to the grandparents. In his case, we were able to narrow it down to the grandparents and lucky for us, there were only two sons to choose from um, in that line. We were able to do some Google internet sleuthing. We were able to find a half brother, a potential half brother. We knew it was either gonna be a cousin or a half brother. We contacted them, sent them a DNA test and ta-da, he now has 11 siblings. <laughs> from his father. So, I mean, his father is now deceased. 
but he has been on this journey where they have, you know, accepted him. And every time I look up, he is with another sibling, with another cousin, meeting up with an aunt, meeting up with, you know, just all over the U.S. And so it has been a really, really good experience for him um, using the documents. And this is the one of um, the cases that we dealt with when we talk about the Native American. So we're talking about a young man who had no clue about any Native American ancestry because, you know, you have to start with who your parents are first. So we were able to, in that line, go back um, to second great grandparents. And we, a lot of that we were able to do with using the, um, the Dawes Commission and the Dawes World um, applications. One specific to the Mississippi Band of Choctaws um, in 1901, there were 10 of his family members who um, applied for the Dawes Roll for a grand total of 36 individuals. Every single application was denied. So that sent, but the good part about that is we have the transcripts and there's fold three. If you have the all access um, membership to Ancestry, which I think is like 199 for six months, it also gives you access to fold three and newspapers.com. And so you can usually look up the documents. You can also find them on the um, National Archives website for free. It's just easier to find them on Fold3, but there is um, a free alternative to find those documents. We were able to read some of those transcripts, to try to determine why were they all rejected? Like they all you know, had the story and a lot of it came back down to the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek of 1830. If you did not register for that um, at that time in 1901, they weren't uh, accepting your application. And in doing that, because we are doing history books beyond just the genealogy, it's not just family tree searching, it's also, you know, so we're putting it in historical context. So as part of that um, question finding, we were trying to figure out like, what were the determining factors in the Mississippi Choctaw registration? You know, who were the commissioners? How were the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians different from other tribes? Who were the responsible parties in the Treaty of Dancing, Ra Dancing Creek Rabbit? You know, is there additional information that is available? So what we were able to determine is that there was a Colonel by the name of William Ward who was designated to be the Indian agent for the Mississippi Choctaw after the Treaty of Dancing Creek Rabbit. It was his job to register the Choctaws who wanted to um, relocate to the Indian Territory, as they called it, um, which is now in present day Oklahoma primarily, or if they wanted to stay because that was one of the um, caveats in the Treaty of Dancing Creek Rabbit in order to get it passed is that those Mississippi Choctaw who wanted to stay locally could, if they set up on a piece of the designated land and did improvements for over the course of five years. But William Ward famously and knowingly refused to register many of the Choctaws. And so when it came time to turn in the report, he said nobody had registered. And that allowed him then to be able to sell land that had been previously designated for Choctaw to his family members who to this day still benefit from those um, land transactions. Um, there's a place called Ward Hall in Kentucky. If you look that up, it has a, in 2021, there's still like a little brief sentence about, you know, um, praising William Ward for allowing, helping his son and son-in-law to be able to acquire this land. And that's how they were, you know, basically cheated out of their land. And so that's when you're talking about dealing with the Native Americans and how do you find that ancestry? You have to do the research, you have to do the searching. And that's part of what we do in the history book is we don't just take the information and then just publish the family story. We now put in historical context to determine what affected that legacy, what you know changed the, the progress or what you know impacts were on that oldest ancestor that you know, we're able to document and find that we are then talking about in our book. Another case that we are dealing with, so here we go. Here's Fred and his newfound, some of his newfound family. Um, this is a picture of him and his high school picture and his father's high school picture. 
little resemblance to say the least. Um, here we have pictures of him with his three of the siblings that he has recently um, come into contact with. So I just wanted to share some of that. Um, I think just last Saturday, he was an Escondido at a cousin that he found through Ancestry. She's a musician. So he went to go see her and meet her for the first time. So Fred is very much all in to the finding his family and they've been very um, supportive and accepting. And so this is just some of the pictures from that, some of the outcomes that we get excited about from doing this research. One of our other participants who's going to be in the book, her name is Natasha. We were able to actually document 12 living 100% African cousins using her DNA. A lot of that was made possible by the fact that we were able to save those low level matches that we were talking about earlier. Because before Ancestry did their purge, they let everybody know. And so some of these more technologically advanced software related gurus who deal with the DNA had done a patch that you could do to, in order to download your small matches to preserve them even after um, Ancestry's wipeout of you know, their purge. So using those low level matches allowed us to find these 12 living cousins. We're in the process of getting in touch with them to see if there's any information that um, can be shared. So there'll still be that gap of um, enslavement, post-enslavement, but now we've you know, crossed the Americas into Africa and she's able to at least um, glean some part of her history from what their um, experience is as being, you know, 100% African and what they know about their family members. So even though she may never figure out exactly how they are connected, she has still found that connection and that's using the DNA. And that's the only way that's possible. There's no other way to do that because when you're looking at the DNA, the other thing is that already at this point, you will not match 50% of your fourth cousins. So with each generation, you lose access to that many more people. So when we're trying to get over the um, roadblock of enslavement, we are now at the point to where we are three and four generations out. So the next generation will not, you know, very likely it's just gonna, it's gonna continually get harder. So that's the other reason for the importance of doing the work and researching and documenting and publishing it. There's so many history books that were, that are privately held so much good information that gets lost because generally families have a single historian in the family who has everything. And then when they die, people already have a house full of their own stuff. So they come and just throw everything away and you lose all that documentation and all that information. So that also speaks to the importance of publishing beyond um, your inner circle of family. We were also to, able to connect her line to free people of color in Maryland and Virginia through some court documents and census records. So here we have the Mouchettes um, living in Virginia in 1860. They are European, they're white, Scottish. Um, they're living next door to blacks and mulattoes in 1860. So this is pre, um, this is, you know, during enslavement. And they, so then we start doing some more research on free people of color during that time. We see here we have the Mouchette line, which also intersects with the Hanson line because that was another big thing is on, that Family Search has is a lot of old books, family history books that have been written um, from the 1700s. And so you can find sometimes names in those and find surnames that are in your location. And then you start looking at your DNA results, searching for these names in your tree. So, you know, or in your matches trees. Um, it's one of the functions on Ancestry that is still available. So you do that and then try to find your connection to a European, 100% European person to determine whether or not this is truly your line. If you do connect to this, you may not be able to figure out who the exact individual is, but you can see if there is a connection. And so with her line, we were able to find Mouchettes, Hansons, Whites, um, a lot of the surnames that are in this um, accounting to say that there is a connection. There's definitely um, a connection. We've not been able to like specifically say which person it is, but we do know that there is some overlap there. And so some of the questions that we'll be answering in her chapter of the book is, 
What was the relationship between free people of color and white settlers in Virginia and Maryland? Um, we found documentation that there was a, an indentured servant. She was white who had, and her name was Margaret Gilmore. She had um, relations with an African man and had children. She was indentured to the age of 31. She died before reaching 31 and then her enslaver, um, well, be, then became an enslaver because he tried to indenture her um, mixed race children till they were 31 because that was a condition of the mother. And at that time, children were following the condition of the mother. Um, her child, Patty, sued for her freedom and won. Her child, Sabra, um, sued for her freedom four years before Patty, and hers was denied. So one of the things we're trying to figure out is what was the difference between those two cases? Mind you, this is the 1790s when this has happened. We also want to know, what did it take to like go to court? How, how are you able to you know, even wage a legal battle? But one was, one was you know, accepted and one was denied. That's once again, we're just constantly asking questions, constantly looking for who the players were. Like, is it a difference of judge? Does she have different information? And so we're trying to find those court documents. Um, COVID obviously presents a lot of issues in terms of um, archival research because so many of the archives are closed. So we are... Um, working on that. And then it may not even be out there to be found. But these are things that um, we are looking to answer. It's like how was freedom obtained and maintained as laws changed? We know that laws were oftentimes drafted to control, whether it was the Native Americans or it was um, um, you know, formerly enslaved or free people of color. You know, um, outlawing interracial you know, relationships where previously it hadn't been an issue. It became an issue as time went on because of the uh, necessity to control that labor force, to use that free labor to um, continue to expand their territories across the US. And then, so this is the other question we already talked about is do any of her African cousins have more information about her African ancestry? These are things that we're working on. So those are just two of the chapters. We are looking to do 25 chapters for um, February. And as you see, it's a lot of research, a lot of work goes into those. And that's the reason why we do what we do because we understand that it's a lot for the common person to do, but there's just so much more, there's so much to get out of it. We wanna teach people how to do their own research because research is never done. There's always gonna be another ancestor. There's always gonna be another story to be found and to be told. And so the best, you know, nobody can afford to just, well, I guess some people can, people I know can afford to just continually pay, you know, a professional researcher $250, $400 an hour to continue to do, you know, ongoing lifetime of research. So this allows us to teach individuals how to do their own research, how to pass on those skills to, you know, the younger generations so that they can continue as technology improves and access to some of those records improve. And now we are at our final question and answer period. All right, you do have some questions here. So I'm gonna go up to, um, Simona has a question and her ask is, on average, what's the minimum amount of time one should expect to get some results in genealogy building? Um, you said the minimum amount of time? I mean, you can get some results instantly. It really depends on what your question is. Um, what you're trying to find out if you are and how far back you're trying to go. So like I have some cases that you literally have to put on the table, you know, just put on the bookshelf for a while because there's just not enough other testers for you to compare against that are close enough for you to determine that match. You have to remember that this is a collaborative sport. You have to have somebody else who you match in order to find out what those commonalities are. And if you come from, like I have one case that I've been working on for three years. I had one minor breakthrough recently because a new match showed up that was a close match. There's a website called DNA Painter. It's a program. And you can use that to map out the you know, hypothetical relationships of unknown matches. So you put in the number of CMs and where they go, and it'll help you determine like how many names you're looking for, how many generations are between you and them, what's the probability that you're a whole cousin, a half cousin, a 
half niece or things like that. And you keep working that to give you um, probabilities. And so I use that to figure out where this new match comes in, but we still have not finally you know, determined. And we're really just looking for the father. So that's just one case where normally I can find a father fairly quickly, but this is um, a 19, case from the early 1900s. And we believe that there was a name change and that there's a small family. Um, so that just reduces the number of uh, descendants who would have tested in order to find. So it just really varies. It just depends on what you're trying to find. It can take a lifetime, depending on the answers you're looking for. Hey, the so next question comes from Callie Sutter. I hope I said that right, Callie, sorry. Um, what are some of the best formats for publishing family history documentation? There's a lot of programs. I, I, I don't have a best, honestly, I'm sorry. I mean, that's part of the reason too why we are creating our own. Um, you really, there's a lot of different websites. If you just do a Google search, there's a lot of companies that do family book research, including um, the Family Tree Maker software. It has a bookmaking feature in it. So does like really all the Family Tree software I think have some sort of bookmaking function in that, and there's some companies who do it independently. Um, you can also print reports um, and, you know, put those in binder form, go to, you know, blurb.com or some of those other sites to, um, you know, create your own book that you have formatted yourself the way that you want it, because the information is different, like depending on what you want to highlight and what, you know, your focus is, what type of documents you have, what type of stories that you want to tell. So, that's what I would suggest for that is to um, use those reports that you can download from those tree making software and work with like Blurb or some of these other um, sites that you can you know self publish to um, design what you want your pages and things to look like. Perfect. All right, we have another question coming in from me. Are there any international databases for those who are first or second generation immigrants? Specific, no, not to my knowledge, I'll say that. I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't know. So I can't say of any specific one that I know of that I've had actual experience in using. So the way that, you know, but there's also genealogical societies all over the world. So Google the area that you're, you know, if there's a specific area that you're looking for, start, you know, narrowing, you, putting in the things that you do know and, you know, work, work back from that to see what comes up in your Google searches, what keywords start coming up, what starts generating information. And once again, like I say, Facebook groups are your very best friend. They're, you know, they're free. There's lots of free information. There's lots of people who are doing the same type of work that you're doing, both professionals, you know, like myself, who just want to share, who just love it when people find their people and, you know, um, give out, you know, advice and help in doing that. So I would say to, you know, Google search and look for some Facebook groups that are specific to the type of research that you're interested in, location. Uh, that's all you have for now in terms of questions, so. Perfect, because it's 155. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put back like all the links to our genetic legacy, um, Facebook, and then also Instagram. So it's going to be in the chat. So yes, everybody, please follow us, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I'm recently starting to tweet. You don't really have to follow that one yet because I'm still figuring that one out. But in terms of keeping up with, you know, um, information on research, you know, new upcoming things in addition to things that we're doing in workshops and things that we present, because our goal is to have as many people as possible be able to do this research. And so that's the reason why we're a nonprofit publishing house, because we wanted to set ourselves up in a way that we could continue to offer those resources and try to remove some of those um, paywall restrictions that particularly affect, you know, really affect everybody, but really affect, um, you know, communities of color have a high impact to where it seems like it's a luxury, but there's so much information that we just want people to be able to have and to share with their families. I think that's it, if there's any. There is one more question that came in. What's that? 
So um, one unrelated question, how common is it to find DNA to implicate someone in a crime? I think you kind of covered yeah. that in the beginning. It's all, it's all the exact same process, honestly. It's the same process of finding a criminal as it is to finding your father, if you don't know who that is. Um, so really, it just really depends on the amount of available data to compare against the number of, you know, DNA tested people who, you know, are being compared against those who are really specializing in that work. I think it's Parabon, um, Cece Moore. She started off doing adoption cases and she's kind of, um, her career has morphed more into dealing with um, the criminal aspect. It's the same process and it just really has the same outcomes. It just really depends on who's out there to be able to compare against and working back those lines. So uh, it's the same. All right, everybody. Uh, 158. One more question. Okay. Anybody have one? Make it quick. If not, you can always email me as well. Um, Shelly, S H E L O I E, at ourgeneticlegacy.org. Um, I will answer your questions if you say that I was at Creative Mornings. Otherwise, I will direct you to the website and you can schedule a consultation. So that is a tidbit that you will still have access. Um, and if you match any of my kits, I will always help. It's just, I can't help it. <laughs> it's like my curiosity and my wanting to like, oh, I can figure that one out. I know who that is. Um, it always gets the best of me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Shelly and Nick. This was a pleasure. It was wonderful to learn all of this and I look forward to learning more in the future. I definitely love to have you back. Um, all right, I'm gonna give you all a second to save the chat. And then otherwise, if you want to, let's see, come off mute and say thank you, you can do that. And I'll close up the room pretty shortly. Thank you all so much for being here. Have a great day. Thanks, Sally. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Shelly. <laughs>